Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to NCIE's NAIDOC panel. Um, my name is Indu Balachandran. I'm the Strategic Projects Advisor at the NCIE, and um, I'm the moderator for today's panel discussion on sustainability and caring for country. Um, I'm like to pay my uh, acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, thank you to our panelists, to our live audience, and those of you who are um, uh, online. So we at the NCIE have a long and proud history of celebrating Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, culture and communities every year at NAIDOC. It's a big week for us and we're really excited to continue the tradition this year. To keep mobs safe this year though, um, a lot of our events are online, including this one. So we're thrilled to actually be able to use technology to take the message all over the country. Um, I'm really excited and we all are to be celebrating with you and reflecting on the theme this year, always was, always will be. And I think it's particularly relevant to the topic discussion um, we're having today. Uh, so I'm going to start the panel by introducing our panelists here today. Um, please welcome uh, to my left here, Sky Trudget, proud mother and First Nations woman and NCIE's Black Impact Lead. Sky is currently completing um, a PhD in Indigenous Data Sovereignty and Models of Care for High-Risk Young People. Over the years, Sky has been involved in numerous research and evaluation projects, including place-based collective impact and government initiatives. Thank you, Sky, for joining us. Um, Claire McHugh, um, also we're very pleased to have her um, join the panel today. Claire is NCIE's CEO um, and comes to NCIE uh, with a long history in land rights, worked for a very long time at the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, and so we're really thrilled to have Claire and her perspective here today. And then joining us from Wiradjuri country is um, Megan Williams. Um, Megan is a research lead and assistant director of the National Centre for Cultural Competence at the University of Sydney. She has over 20 years experience working on programs and research to improve the health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the criminal justice system. Um, so thank you for joining us and we should kick into this panel discussion. So we, th the, the, the kind of broad theme for today's discussion is we know that there's this kind of increasing interest in sustainability around Australia and around the world. Um, and we know that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a long history of understanding and caring for country. So um, really today we wanted to explore with all the different expertise here and also you know, people's practices, how does sustainability interact with notions of caring for country um, and how these ideas and practices have a place in urban environments. So NCI, you know, we're in Redfern, Aboriginal, um, Aboriginal red fern and increasingly gentrifying. I've been talking to some of my colleagues in this community over the last week. And so what does um, sustainability, country and connection to land mean in Aboriginal urban environments like the one we're in today? So maybe what I can do is um, kick off and give each of the panelists um, the opportunity to really talk us through, you know, um, what does sustainability mean to you um, what does caring for country mean to you? And how do you incorporate this into your varying professional practices? So maybe if I kick off with Sky. Thank you, Yuzi. Um, I am not well versed in uh, traditional caring for country and environmental causes, but to me, sustainability is the balance of all the things that keep us healthy. Sorry, I'm not great with a mic either. Um, and so to me that, is a number of things that can be um, the country itself, the place, the people, um, our health, our education, the things that make us strong, the things that, that make us healthy, and it's how we give back to that and then receive from that in a really balanced and even way. Um, so to me, that's what sustainability is. And caring for country, um, when I think about country from a sustainability perspective, in my view of what sustainability is, 
um, caring for country is caring for the thing that nurtures us, the place where we, we get to live out who we are um, in our physical form, um, but also the thing that gives back to us, that helps us be strong in spirit and who we are, and it's our job to care for that, to look after that, and to keep giving back. So it exists not just for us, but for everyone beyond us as well. And um, as, I suppose, in your work, as a, you know, you're the lead for Black Impact, and you have a long kind of history in evaluation, how do you um, incorporate um, your practice in this area into your work? Yeah, so uh, we've done a couple of things. It's been really important at the moment for us to kind of understand that what is the balance, what is sustainability uh, from an evaluation perspective. There's been heaps of really good work that's been done on it, um, particularly in an Indigenous space um, internationally. Um, what we've found as a team when we've gone through various frameworks that could talk to sustainability and the balancing of all the parts that keep us healthy and strong was we didn't find that there was one particular framework that worked for us and worked for the work that we're doing with NCIE. Um, so we developed a framework um, and that framework loosely looks at um, how do we have agency as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people how do we connect uh, with each other and with the things that are important to us? Um, how do we connect with culture and culture being different for all of us? And then how do we also connect with place? So considering that place for us could be where we are at a point in time, um, it could be as big or as little as we like, so that there's a variance in place and, and health and in what keeps us strong and that we see that change and impact happens at often an individual level then um, at a community or like cohort level and then into a greater systems level where that there's a majority of you or majority impact for a cohort. Um, so we've developed a framework that helps us understand that a little bit better. Um, it's still in its testing phase with the NCIE work that we're doing with Claire and the team here. So I could report more on that later. Yeah, great. Yeah. We'll come, it's really interesting. Maybe I'll move to, um, Megan, you, I mean, your uh, history and experience professionally has been, what was interesting is, you know, you've worked in the university, the urban university environment, but you also have a long history in um, health and kind of Aboriginal well-being, particularly in the criminal justice system. It would be really interesting to hear your views on, you know, how you think of sustainability country and how you bring that into your practice. Well, yes, thanks, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Wiradjuri country and the land of the Daby people, and uh, my Williams family um, are here in town, Some and but really we're the neighbours, we're the mudgy, mudgy mob. So I pay my respects to um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who make this a great community with events um, going on all the time, actually, not just in Nadoc week. It, lots of what Sky said resonates with me. Really, I've been driven nonstop by trying to assist any way possible in getting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people out of prison because they are males in my family often or people who we really need in the community. We really need to not be caught up in the system, of course not perpetrate violence or crime to prevent that occurring to heal from that occurring for that to not occur again so that we've got more people in the community and I was lucky enough to be trained as a researcher in the early 90s when I was still a teenager I'm um, in peer-based research and I was kind of lucky enough to work out that if I straightened out a bit I could be on the workforce side of um service delivery rather than client service delivery, even though I still need constant support. But, um, but that meant me being a researcher in community organisations, um, mainly needle and syringe programs, where we saw Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who didn't access mainstream services or community controlled services either, partly because of that criminal justice system involvement. But I learned pretty quick by the time I was in my early 20s that the cycle just went round and round and actually that service providers perpetuated it partly, largely. The 97% that Sky talked about who didn't know how to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander principles of research 
or families or culture and that imposition of mainstream Western ideas onto us, that desire to fix us and get us to fit into the mainstream, you know, that absolutely drove me crazy, like many of us, because of the lack of respect for Aboriginal cultures having inherent value in this country uh, as real leaders to heal. So um, like Sky, I just see things with those, the layers of the onion at the, you know, there's work I've got to do constantly on myself in terms of keeping myself sustainable. Um, I did work on that group discussion guide that goes with the film Meg Bastard. And I don't think I, I got the nickname Meg Bastard for nothing too, because if I don't keep myself well, I can go off and I don't want to be that person. So each and every day I have to try to keep my own self in check that's both my physical health it's my ego it's my rage and um and also being a mother you know another layer is me being well in the family unit so that those teenagers get a arguably better start than what I did and you know today we've we're here on Wiradjuri country the teenagers have just been filled with excitement at a three or four hour weaving workshop that they're at now they, the chills they got when they touched the textures and they saw what they may possibly learn to make and their comments about all they want to do is weave and talk, you know. So, so that's that sustainability of the next generation's identity as Wiradjuri. Yeah. And while we always knew, we, we were also really forced into being mainstream mm. and it just absolutely didn't fit. And, you know, hence that sort of knowing and seeing family and criminal justice system, knowing that that's just a symptom, really not the cause. So um, so research too, that sustainability in research, it's absolutely about using the ethical guidelines that have been in place for 20 years. I constantly, every day of my work life, am upskilling, shall we say, people who've never heard of them or never used them or never put them really into genuine practice. And so, I mean, that is just extremely poor behaviour of, you know, professors and people who have funded huge amounts of money. So unless we get more Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander researchers, we just are going to be on the receiving end constantly of this churn of their workforce who doesn't follow the ethical guidelines that are in place and so evaluation yeah have a framework for health um, related um, program evaluation called Nabinya yeah. um, which in Wiradjuri kind of means to do and reflect and and do and um, yeah and that's um, been published and pretty well taken up in all kinds of places and um, you know I think it is helpful to at least stimulate the thinking about sustainability it can't lead to sustainability um, and so then in terms of country there's a, just a, another you know layer and story in, entirely so um, yeah um, lots to think and talk about that it's really interesting um, Megan you kind of brought us back to the notion of sustainability in this personal environment as Aboriginal people and how you have to kind of keep the faith and manage the rage, um, which is actually, I think, really pertinent for the lives um, that people might lead. How do you, um, how does that intersect with the work you've done? I mean, you're um, leading the Centre for Cultural Competence at one of the largest universities in the inner city environment of Sydney. Um, what are your reflections and how that intersects with how cultural competence and sustainability interacts with that kind of environment? Yeah, it does. Um, you know, and I asked a local Aboriginal woman that the other day, you know, how do you just keep going? And she just so simply said, the answers are in country. Let country sustain you when you're here, you know, listening to country watching the birds, watching the clouds float by and just, you know, be really in the moment with all of that and ask country what it needs 
and what it needs me to do rather than feeling that the burden is on me to decide and have to career plan and um, be all strategic. Yeah. You know, probably one of my most um, pressing worries is that I'm not strategic enough. I'm not recording this session for me to write up and convey to all my colleagues, you know, or I'm not double downing on everything. Um, but I have to take that pressure off myself, rest in country, um, rest in also knowing how incredible it is that I am a Williams and we're from around here and we're still connected. Mm. And um, so there's that element of it. But at the National Centre for Cultural Competence, you know, I, I deliberately sought to move there because more and more I couldn't work on justice and health research unless I could work on issues to do with the mainstream workforce. Time and time again over the last 20 or so years, the buck stops at the mainstream workforce, not being able to implement our recommendations or even take our recommendations higher in government mm. or let alone fund them, let alone invite us to be at the table in decision-making about funding. So, um, so that's... The National Centre for Cultural Competence allows me to participate in actually really gentle processes of stimulating people to critically self-reflect and understand their own culture. Mm. So it's not Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander culture, it's all cultures. And I like that because it takes the pressure off us as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander right. people, puts the onus and the responsibility back on the mainstream to understand why do they call themselves non-Indigenous that's crazy to me. It means you're a non-entity or something. Please talk about who you are, not who you're not. And if you don't know how to talk about who you are, here's 101 tips and treasures on how to do that. And at the NCCC, um, to really be in a safe environment, it, it is quite a safe space because everyone's working towards um, this deeper level of understanding of themselves in order to work there, you do have to walk the talk um, a bit. You know, you can't really teach about and then be abusive to your workmates. <laughs> so You've um, left us with some really actually very powerful yeah. ideas. So I'm going to move to Claire. Um, Claire, can you share with us, I suppose, your... As a CEO of NCIE, and I think, like many people at NCIE, all the various other lives you lead um, in other communities and other spheres, um, what is sustainability, what is caring for country, what is your practice, and then how do you incorporate that into your professional um, environment? Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> Great. I think um, in terms of sustainability, I think um, both panellists have um, really unpacked that um, quite well, so I'm not too sure how much more I could add to that except to say I absolutely agree that sustainability is very much um, um, layered and complex when you talk about sustainability for First Nations people. Um, it is very uh, much linked to our identity and sustainability is not just the idea or the concept of sustaining something or a place so that it um, that it lives on into the future. But sustainability is very much a two-way concept around we sustain the land and the land sustains us. Yep. So it, it's, um, it's, it's definitely layered and um, meaningful and complex and beautiful. In terms of caring for country, I think um, I've grown up in and around um, Sydney, uh, Redfern area pretty much most of my life. So caring for country for me is very much in this urban context and an urban setting. And when we talk about sustainability and we talk about caring for country in an urban setting, it's very much around finding opportunities as First Nations people to connect back to country, um, to strengthen our identity. And um, you mentioned earlier around gentrification and how we continue to maintain um, country and connection to country, I guess, in a space such as Redfern, where in the space of even the last 10 years, um, so much has changed. Yep. Um, the, 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 what I see around me and how even the way in which people who identify as being 
um, mob from Redfern, the way that they connect back into this place and this space has changed um, just because of that gentrification. So for me, um, that caring for country is very much in an urban setting linked to identity and how we can continue to connect to place and remain um, visible mm. and um, visible and alive yep. and thriving in that place and space when it's changing so rapidly around us and when it's changing so rapidly around us there's no planning or thinking around how do we ensure that the the dna of first nations people remains yep. um, in that space because we're being pushed out um, we can't afford to live here. We can't afford to reside here. We, you know, we have people at the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence. I talk to, um, you know, some of our patrons who come through all the way from out western Sydney yep. who come here to use the fitness centre or to bring their children to swimming lessons. And it's like, why do you travel all that way? Mm. Because they want their children to be connected to country yep. in Redfern. And the only way to do that is to bring them to participate in the activities that happen here. Yep. And there are so few of those happening right now. Um, so I see the, the the way I guess that's embedded in my, what I do yep. <laughs> in my work is very much around um, ensuring that what I'm doing is trying to keep a place for First Nations people who relate back to being I'm Redfern Mob. Yeah, it's mm. interesting. And, you know, you speak of this desire for community members to come and be in this place and participate in this place and participate in those activities. And, you know, we hear the word uh, healing a lot, not necessarily in the notion like to f as a, a kind of thing to fix, but it's, it's far um, greater than that. And I know, Megan, it's, a, it's an idea that you work with a lot. I'd be really interested to hear from you on, you know, in response to Claire's... Um, you know, her advocacy and work in maintaining this place and space so people can connect to it and participate in a place that is community, in, a, in a, an environment that is decreasingly Aboriginal because of gentrification. Um, be great to hear from you on how healing works in the work you do and how that kind of connection to country and place plays out. Yeah, thanks. I think my favourite... Um Ever work has been with the Healing Foundation and its collective healing program. And I, I always got a note that it's not the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Healing Foundation, it's the Healing Foundation, you know, because it's for all Australians to learn from. Even it's Aboriginal led, and the majority of programs and um, participants are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander. But it's such an example of, um, well, reconciliation's one word, but demonstrating how stolen generations members and, you know, four or so generations of descendants still staunchly promote to us the value and the importance of having an Aboriginal identity or Torres Strait Islander identity, that they never lost that. They never for a moment... Um, thought that it would go forever and everything they teach us is about maintaining that and mm. so the collective healing programs I think are such a relief for me having worked in a health sector where the focus is on the individual you know at the end of the day I'm responsible for my healing and for what goes on between my ears but gee I've needed a lot of help to be able to understand it and each and every day um, actively seek and receive and give help to others as well um, on that, you know, I think it's going to be a lifelong journey of recovering from trauma and ex partly because it's exclusion at work, exclusion from committees, exclusion from re research documents triggers a little bit of that trauma. Um, I think, and that that's across a couple of generations in lots of our families. But um, so collective healing is about finding shared values and common ground 
and there's that real identification that happens when people who've gone through similar things really understand in ways that psychologists, social workers can't and don't. Mm. And I say that respectfully in a way to them because I'm familiar almost with every inch of psychology curriculum, social work curriculum, and I know that there aren't adequate challenges for all of the students to really engage with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people's experiences of trauma or, or modes of healing. The curriculum just cannot do it yet, even though Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people have put in a huge effort to try to develop that curriculum better. But it means we're still on the receiving end of professionals who can't really get it and don't really get it and they can actually perpetuate self-doubt and trauma and exclusion and ultimately that's another experience of abuse. So that's why that um, Healing Foundation's collective healing is sort of takes the power out of those professions uh, and their position as, as professionals yep. and it tells all of us that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder healing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is enough. It is decent. It is valuable and it is to be um, continued. And the Stolen Generations, um, a couple of my colleagues and I were scribes and we helped document how they did collective healing and, um, and that resource is online and it was made so that other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups who wanted to do collective healing, sort of the unfunded programs that aren't tangled in government funding and KPIs mm. um, could set those up. And um, so, yeah, that um, to me, you know, is really part of sustainability because it's healing and it's building that um, identity and pride yep. and it's got the next generations in mind. And um, the other program that I've worked on is the Aboriginal Family Wellbeing Program, which was also started by Stolen Generations <clears throat> people um, about 30 years ago. And it's got a story of how it's travelled all over Australia. And basically um, it's never been run in Sydney, but a few of us have done... Um, a few actions and activities to ask around about whether people in Sydney would want that program to be run. And, um, you know, COVID sort of put an end to that, yeah. except now even this is really demonstrating that we can do things quite intimately online and family wellbeing potentially could be run online. But basically it's a six-week full-time sort of equivalent of content yeah. um, and everyone who goes through that can then do the like train the trainer element of it to like so it's part of the sustainability of that program <clears throat> but it's that principle of um, each one teach one mm. for sustainability and then it's also that um, principle of the more I tell others or impart my story the more I'm reminded of how far I've come yep. and the more that drives my footsteps to keep trying to be um, a little bit straighter, like better and more aligned with myself and my spirit each day. So that um, Aboriginal Family Wellbeing Program's got about 40 different publications associated with it, a national centre that's been supported by the Lowich Institute, a couple of generations of um, trainers who've run it and, um, you know, yeah, I use elements of it all through life, through teaching. And what it also does is has a bit of language so that other people who've done family wellbeing can help remind you. And there's a, even a few hand symbols out of it. So yep. it's that sustainable reminder within each of us, you know, like that, you know, just feel your heart or, um, yeah. So those are two um, particular programs in relation to individual and community level healing you know because then for me I'm more available to do other business yep. related to family and work and also 
um, country. And I'll just add to part of me being here in northeast Wiradjuri country, it's healing in itself because it's healed a, a um, you know, a gap in my family and, and also I just feel I just want to shout out to country, you know, and... <laughs> We can feel say, it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> here. here and, um, <laughs> but, but that's only happened here for me because I finally chose to commit. You know, I'd lived in, I've lived in Sydney about what, eight years and all it was was a matter of committing. It could have been the inner west in Sydney or it could have been when I lived on the Gold Coast or it could have been. It, I just wasn't ready in myself to commit to the bigger level of um, caring for country because yeah. I was needed to sort my own self out more. Um, so that's why I encourage other people. It doesn't matter if you're not from your, that country or whatever, but it's just committing. And, yep. you know, I think that's what NCIEs put that there, the committed that's a really actually um some of the questions I've had from people relate very much to well you know what are some calls to action and what are some practical ways that people in urban settings can connect and that's a I think commit that's a really um, great call to action now I'm realizing as I hear listen to all of you that you're all mothers and I'm hearing very much this um, uh, this desire to to inculcate and to to be with and to work with family. So I'm going to come back to that and ask uh, you you to speak to you know I suppose country and children and as mothers what that means for you as um, particularly as First Nations mums. But before I do, the notion of collecting collective healing that you spoke of, Sky. I know when. Um, when we worked on the NCIE framework, you know, we talked about this individual community society. How does um, what Megan is speaking of um, intersect or interact with um, what you were discovering or thinking in that framework? It is exactly what we heard. So to me, when I was listening to both of you, it was a reminder of all the things that people were telling us as being really important when we went through that project. So the two big things that we heard was COVID had this huge impact on not allowing you to go and be in the places that keep you healthy, that, that sustain your spirit, that make you feel strong again. And that wasn't just country, but it was also places. So places like NCIE, was it, mm. we heard it over and over again. How do I get back to that, that community organisation or just that place where I can just go and be and I see other people? Or how do I even just go next door or go and see family? And so um, I then thought, like, further to that work, we were talking about, well, what are the really good things that we've done as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to move past that? Because we are sustainable in ourselves, in who we are, we're strong, we keep going forward, we keep, we keep rejuvenating, we keep coming back stronger every time. And that was things like we're doing right now. So we have virtual meetings, we connect, we, we understand what we've got to do and how we do it different and we just do it. And so um, that, like this entire conversation brought all those things back yeah. again. Um, the only other thing I would add in terms of projects of what we've seen, um, is a project that we're, we're just about to start working on um, and it's called Array. And so this is a project run by the ABC Foundation over in WA. Um, and Array stands for Aboriginal Women in Research and Evaluation. And the purpose of this project is to train Aboriginal women to be able to conduct evaluations and lead research support work or evaluations on country. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're really getting that local contact context and wisdom that you need to do good research and good evaluation and so um, there, there is like this shift towards doing more sustainable practice in evaluation and research um, so that hopefully that kind of thing grows so a training then a learning so NCIE are participating in helping these ladies not only um, go through training but also come and do some work placement participate on evaluations um, and then go on to have a sustained role in a, um, either an organisation or as a contractor. So, yeah, I think there's some really good stuff happening and it's 
heartwarming to be a part of it and to kind of sit here on the panel. But yeah, it's I don't know that I have much to add, but I can see all the links that yeah. kind of go on between all those bits. So it's good. Well, I think um, I mean what we are all hearing is um, you keep all of you keep kind of saying you don't have, but actually it's your your actual active being and working and doing the things you do that create the webs that um, are causing action to happen. So um, it's really, I think it's really valuable for people who are listening to hear how, you know, as individuals, as First Nations people, um, you think about and practice and consider notions of country and sustainability in your everyday life, your personal lives and your professional practice. Um, which kind of links in, again, I think I'm going to come back to that notion of um, all of you being mums, because all of you have kind of mentioned <laughs> um, your kids uh, and, you know, how important what is happening around you culturally and on country um, feeds into your, your identity as Aboriginal mums. So it, maybe I can start with Claire and, you know, how sustainability, country... Um, caring for country and intergenerational learning plays into, you know, your um, work as a mother? I, um, I think for me, um, and I'll kind of, it, it's a different space, I guess, that I occupy when I think of um, my children and their identity and their connection to country. My partner um, is from the La Perouse Aboriginal community, which is like a stone's throw down the road from Redfern, but they are two distinctly separate, different communities with their own um, their own makeup and their own yep. histories and stories. And I was very much um, raised with a strong knowledge of my um, my history and my identity. But when it came to um, and my Aboriginality and all of that stuff, but when it comes to um, connection to country and connection to culture. Um, that's something which, unfortunately, I um, wasn't blessed with, obviously, as a result of past government policies. Um, and um, it was kind of something that was lost through my family growing up on missions and reserves and where um, practising culture. And you can't talk about country. You can't talk about caring for country without talking about who we are as a people and how we practise um, culture and everything we do is linked back to country. So removing Aboriginal people um, as a form of a like a government policy um, back in the day to under Aboriginal Protection Board Act to control um, the lives of Aboriginal people, um, to remove them from their traditional lands and their country um, and to stop them from practising language and practising customs and traditions such as the, the dance and ceremony, um, all of that and the removal of children from their families was all an extremely tactical move to try and break um, the fabric of society that makes us who we are as Aboriginal people. So um, I, when I speak to my children's connection to country, I very much speak to my partner who has been lucky enough to be raised very strong in culture yeah. and strong in cultural practices where my children, um, you know, went to an Aboriginal um, childcare at La Perouse and were taught language and speak language, um, Dharawal language, and, um, you know, they still have, um, have boys' camps and they go away and they yeah. still honour a structure of what it means to kind of be raised with that in mind, yep. um, and so for me, yeah, ra being a mother of yep. a child <laughs> who is, you know, raising an Aboriginal child um, and keeping that connection, I'm fortunate enough, I suppose, for yep. my husband to still have that connection, but otherwise, you know, they've also got this urban identity yep. and Which this connection. Which you growing up. Yeah, yeah, to like, to places and, and a more urban history and an urban story about Redfern being, you know, the, the birthplace of so many rights, agendas, and so that's also part of their identity as well, but that yep. connection to culture. And one other thing that I will say, because I, I don't want to hog no, the stage, really but one other thing that I will say is that I have observed, and I'm sure there's probably plenty of studies, but I have observed for myself that 
children who are raised with a strong sense of identity and a strong sense of culture and a strong sense of belonging, and they have way... They're set up for life. Yep. Um, they do better, they thrive, they, um, they're stronger, they have much more um, pride in their identity and that sense of belonging and um, compared to children who maybe don't get that opportunity to grow yep. up with that strong connection to country and culture and identity. It's almost like um, we mourn, like I mourn the fact that I um, wasn't raised strong in culture. It's not yep. to say I wasn't raised Aboriginal or strong in... Um, like a more more um, urban sense of what it is to be Aboriginal, but I don't know my language, I don't know my dance, I don't know my, um, you know, my song lines and all of that yeah. stuff, so. Thank you, actually, um, Claire, thanks very much for that, because I think it's really um, given all of us this nuanced sense um, and challenges this no any notion anyone might be having on any kind of homogeneity of Aboriginal experience and history, so... Um, Thank you for that. Um, Megan, do, do you have, how do, how do you negotiate this space and um, what would you think is, is useful for our audience and listeners to hear from you and your, um, your identity as an Aboriginal mum? Yeah, thanks. I think, um, you know, things like NAIDOC week and other, you know, days of celebration and uh, that mainstream's perpetuation of Aboriginal identity can really prescribe to our young people who it is to be Aboriginal, you know, as much as, like, NAIDOC week when it's Aboriginal-driven and with our really trusted allies, um, of course, you know, I support that, but I've also felt the, the bittersweet mm. tear that um, that it tries to tell um, our kids who they um, ought to be. And I guess I just think about m my brother's work um, teaching Dig in a couple of schools and he, um, he sees that a lot. You know, it really, I think, distresses him that these kids are told, well, you're Aboriginal, you go to this class, mm -hmm. but they don't know... Um, much about their histories and it sets them up I think to also feel terrible about themselves that disconnect between being told who you are but not really knowing mm. so that is really scary and as a parent that's scary because you want your kid to grow up you know kids to grow up with that consolidated identity and um my mine are 17 17 year old son and 19 year old daughter and you know they are both really different in their journeys where the young fella's been just so grab you know hands on grabs anything is he's very well spoken and um all kinds of ways that i can see a connection and it's just really different to my daughter. Yeah. Hers is visceral, tactile. It's in her spirit. It's in the way she holds herself. Mm. Um, it's her. Un, un, it's remarkable bond with my dad. And uh, my daughter's also quite reserved. I didn't know for her HSC that she was writing my dad's life story. And when she presented that, she received a community award for that. And when we... Well, firstly, I told her, send it to me, love. I've marked thousands of assignments. I'll edit it for you. <laughs> Nothing to edit, but I just wept because there before me I saw someone who had picked up every bit of what we'd said and yeah. done and who we'd been over the years, and it was all in this story. So it's also that rule, uh, I think, is nothing's ever what it seems mm. <laughs> until you really hear that person's story. Um, we mustn't judge and we've got to give that time for people to tell their story yeah. um, so so that's one part of it and um yeah and I think just really encouraging as you know participation in events too so um yeah I think also not putting too much pressure on on yeah. them you know I think that probably mine and like others have been exposed to some pretty extreme issues that have happened and um, and to always be aware of that too, that they probably have understandings of things like social determinants of health that their other friends at school don't 
mm. and institutional abuses and racism. So to um, always be nurturing, uh, something nurturing about them as well. You know, just when I was down at the um, Wiradjuri Community Centre that's in our, the main street here, um, one of the women, she's Davy, and she just pulled out this and said, oh, can you come tomorrow and sing? And it's a song in language, you know, but I felt that child in me that was, I don't know how to say it. I don't, you know, oh, yeah. what if I get it wrong and all my shame and all my, um, but then the fighting spirit came back and was like, of course. And then she was like, all right, well, let me video myself. And she um, just got straight on my phone, videoed herself singing and it's as easy as that and yeah. away we go, you know. So it's also just really encouraging um, people to take those steps, feel that fear, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things in what you have um, said that I think are quite remarkable. You use the words like gentle and then when you were reflecting on the NCCC, the National Centre of Cultural Competence, um, versus, you know, the pressure Aboriginal children or people have to be appropriately Aboriginal or whatever that means, um, but that it's actually everybody's obligation um, to be culturally competent and not just um, one group of people. It's, I think there's a real linking in the approach that you're advocating um, and the histories and experiences of um, First Nations people, but also the obligations and opportunity that's available for all Australians to participate wholly in this process and to to make themselves responsible, really, for um, how they interact with the history and contemporary issues in this country. So um, there's, uh, there's really kind of beautiful linkages in how you say and what you say, what you're saying. Um, can I move to Sky? Do you, I mean, if you have any reflections in, you know, what country means and what intergenerational learning means and sustainability means as a mother um, that you would like to share with us? You know I can talk about my kids all day, yeah, so <laughs> be prepared. Um, so much learning. So uh, my children are, are still young um, and I have an experience of, of growing up where I wasn't connected to my community, I wasn't connected to my family, and I also am very lucky to have a partner um, who is connected. And, and so yep. in that case, we have we have different histories, and yet we, we are able to bring that together for our kids. And that I feel so good that I can provide that for them and that we can come together and show them this difference. I feel really good that they are so proud like they you know they'll be like oh, I'm Aboriginal like I'm an Aboriginal boy like um they are so proud of who they are and I believe you Megan like they this is part of um just what is going to help drive them so much further through life yep um and I think they've got they've got great family on on both sides that can help them with doing that and with being strong but like in them I see that as being their grounding but as a mum I think um, the thing that I'm learning very deeply at the moment is that all that is important, but I need to be present. So I need to be mum that is healthy and, and well. And like you were talking about, Megan, like in my mind, I need to be here. And so that takes acknowledging what it is in me to be sustained yep. um, and, and to be able to step back and, you know, we're all driven to, to do things and change things through our work and our practice and what we're doing, but it starts at home and it has to be with them first. So that's been my biggest learning of, like, just stop for a minute, take all this energy and put it into them first and then the rest will come out of that. Mm. Very interesting. Um, I am going to actually now... There's a couple of questions that... I had um, provided to me, which I'm, I think feed in really nicely, um, given the perspectives we're hearing. Um, one of them is, you know, how do we as mob, I'm, I'm not Aboriginal, but um, the question came, how do we as mob have our stories and our voices heard in a way that will cause action in this space? Um, and I think it's a really pertinent um, 
an important question. I, I would love to hear if any of you have kind of examples or um, reflections on this, this question. Is there? Uh, yeah, go for it, Claire. Oh, Megan, I'll come back oh, to you. Yeah, okay. definitely. Um, I think across all platforms and in all forms, um, whether it be through the arts and music, through um, working within government forums or government agencies, working on the ground in community organisations. I think we all individually have a role um, and a responsibility to amplify the issues and raise our voices and be seen and be heard as First Nations people. And I see, and I, I guess the thing, thing that strikes me as I'm sitting here on this panel and um, unexpectedly <laughs> this evening... Um, surprise! With, yeah, <laughs> surprise! I like to do things on the fly. Um, but, yes, yeah, sitting here with these um, fabulous panellists is that um, we're purpose-driven. Yeah. And, but it's, it's, I guess, all Aboriginal people, all Torres Strait Islands people, all First Nations people are purpose-driven and we're forced to be purpose-driven. We're forced to be, like, and I always say from the moment you're born, um, First Nations or Aboriginal to this country, you're, um, you're immediately an activist. Yeah. <laughs> you, your whole life, regardless of, um, you know, where you sit on this spectrum of um, your experience of being an Aboriginal person, you're, you're constantly... You're either um, you just you don't fit the mold, you don't fit the stereotype, and you're constantly having to justify um, your identity to people who don't necessarily get the complexities of yeah. our community. And so I think the, that's how we do it, just by being and occupying our own spaces and being a voice of what it means to be who we are. Um, to sustain and what our role is and what our place is in community, place and country. Yeah, mm. it's really interesting what you said because it links very much to what Megan was saying earlier about mainstream imposing ways of being and kind of creating structures that might not actually be inherent or intuitive. So, um, Megan, you also had something to say to that question. Yeah, definitely. And it, um, it comes back to uh, mainstream organisation that I work for, although I don't think they'd want me to call them mainstream, um, and that's um, Crokey Health Media. Oh, yeah. And um, the board chairs an Aboriginal woman um, on the board as well. But um, I've really been able to find my voice through working with Crokey, um, partly through them getting crowdfunding for the Just Justice campaign, hashtag Just Justice, which ran in 2016. And through that, um, we produce a public interest journalism where needs of underserved communities are prioritised and strategies in journalism are used that work for those people and those communities. And so the crowdfunding enabled um, the, the Just Justice group to pay Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, to write articles and also... Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people contributed articles through their work as well. And so over 12 months, we published 90 articles from 70 authors, um, the majority Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and they got published on that croaky website but tweeted out, you know, because um, Twitter's pretty awesome for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of all you know, what walks of this life. And um, it's not the be all and end all, but it's certainly you can really engage with a lot of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people yep. and some hilarious and hideous stuff on online. Um, so I think that demystified journalism, it helped um, stories get out that wouldn't ordinarily. Some things did get cross published at The Guardian and The Conversation. So that broke us sort of into there. Um, also, we really just cherish Indigenous X and that rotated Twitter handle that they have because it, mm. I've done that once, um, I think it was over Christmas, and um, 
you know, that helped me get more confident being online and putting things out online and gathering other people's stories. So, yeah, black media and community-based media I'm um, really, yeah, passionate about. But also, um, Claire, your message at the beginning of NADOC week and the smoking ceremony, that's... Um, it's, you make it look so easy and I know a lot of setup goes into it and we've we've had IDX work with us on a young women in prison project and a smoking ceremony and it was only recent where we wanted to put the call out for anyone who wants to come along on a um, justice health workforce development project is welcome people are still welcome let me know if you want to join that that's it's all about supporting Aboriginal young women better when they are transitioning from prison back to the community. But the focus is not on the Aboriginal young women, it's on the workforce to do better. And what we're doing is um, putting forward some case studies. We're translating six existing research projects to say, look at what these Aboriginal led research projects all say about how to do better. Mm. And what we're, we're using the media as a strategy because we know from research and from our experiences how horrendous the media is um, in perpetuating negative stereotypes about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's incredibly divisive between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well at times and, and that justice health workforce and the corrections workforce, you know, Coronet English in that um, inquest into the death of a woman in Victorian police custody um, said that these are cultures of complacency mm. and, and they're perpetuated by the media. So to me it's using um, different types of media and so public interest journalism and croaky um, Indigenous sex give us that freedom to try out what it's yep. like and... Um, and, and the NCIE, you know, Claire demonstrated that. She just got in front of that camera and told that story and yep. out it goes. So I think we are having more of a visible presence through um, online new technologies and and um, the success of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander organisations during the pandemic as well has yep. been conveyed really widely through online um messages and and the more you know because Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander you know people what is it a third are under 15 like what if we dreamt up loads more IDXs and yep. um and and really had all of that available so those young people grew up confident engaging with the media and shifting that deficit mm. um, lens or at least knowing how to um like not only fight back but put into that space our stories that, you know, I do believe a lot of Australians are mm. wanting to hear because, you know, this is, there are Australians, you know, this is their shame mm. too and their loss and people do feel it and it's not like Australians are, are well and healthy. You know, there's mm. all kinds of issues that are, are worsening in that community and I think we are being looked to as a solution yep. um, and so the onus is back on us to keep telling those stories yep. about exactly how we do business so That's that right. people can um, look to us as leaders and learn from us as well. Yeah, I mean it's a, the response to that question is really take every opportunity. People want to hear what um, you guys have to say. I'm going to now um, give the audience an opportunity, only the live audience gets the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Is there um, anyone here who has a question, just shout it out and I'll mic it up. Anything that um, tickles your fancy uh, or prompts any questions? There's a couple more that I've, I've got from other people pre-event. I'll give you a couple more minutes to think about any questions. Um, I mean, part of this discussion is very much because of the nature of NCI and the work we do. Um, and, you know, Megan, you also spoke about um, living in Sydney and then making the commitment to go out to where you are. Um, and, Sky, you live just outside Sydney. Um, you know, I think one of the questions I had was really about the, the 
the built environment and the building of place and might be something for Claire and Meg and Sky. Um, and it was just a really straight up question, which is, is it enough to have indigenous themed gardens and circular walkways <laughs> if the cost is forcing people from land? Um, I, there's, there's, you know, it's a yes or no answer, <laughs> but it'd be great to hear, um, you know, your observations and reflections are yes or no is not, we all know the answer to that one. Um, but given this question, I mean, that's obviously a frustration that people are seeing in the built environment, in urban environments. Um, is there anything that you've observed in your work places, um, in your life in urban Australia that responds to this? Um, yeah, I'll... Not an easy question, I know, to elaborate. M Megan or Claire, do you have... <laughs> In in my uh, in my um, current like n sort of being at uni of Sydney, there there are these um, Wingaramura design principles, oh, yeah. and um, and they I think were used to guide um, the construction of a couple of new buildings and some circular um, pathways and some gardens, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but you know what it's um, the architects. Uh, and other planners and other um, staff and industry saw them as valuable for their curriculum, for using them to help guide and shape how they actually developed their teaching. Mm. So not just to teach about how to do circular pathways, but to use those design principles because principles underscore action. Mm principles can be interpreted for many actions and they interpreted them for the design of um, some curriculum so those principles are um, like engaged inquiry building a community of practice and mm. being mutually accountable mm. and so um, one thing I've got to work on was developing a template for anything new developed at the uni if right. it's a strategy or a new curriculum yeah or a pathway um, that it meets the like these principles have been developed into prompts. Yep. They do have their um, foundations in Gadigal culture yep. and local culture, including Redfern culture um, and you know Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples culture in Redfern and that Camperdown campus space. Um, and they're not the be all and end all. But, gee, I loved working with them to trigger my thinking in a different way because there was, like, tw there's 20 or 30 prompts of based on knowledges, Aboriginal people's knowledges, to just trigger um, how to do something better. Mm. And, and that always um, helped me to change what I was going to do at the outset to yeah, right. so... Um, yeah, Wingara Mura. They're the Walunga Wingara Mura design principles, the second round of those. So I loved how that was taken from the built environment in uh, and broadened um, much mm. more. And it sounds like it's a guide not just for building um, structures no. and buildings, but also for creating anything, any, any new um, idea or uh, kind of even a social construct in a, a university environment. It's really helpful. Yeah, um, exactly. Do either of you have anything you wanted to add to themed gardens and circular walkways? <laughs> I'll add. Go I'm on. being cautious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I'm adding a personal view, yeah. um, which is, and, and a part comes from the learning of our work, is one that there is, oh, oh, the obvious answer is no. <laughs> Um, but it also highlights the importance of places that allow you to sustain who you are um, and who we are as people. And so, to me, that talks to what NCIE is, um, some of the elements... Hey, Megan. Um, some of the elements that we see around the universities and what Megan's been talking about. Um, so, I think it's important... To, to have it there, but the other part that I've been learning, and so Tyler, has, Tyler Mundine is our designer who's um, working on our Black Impact team, and she really helps us to understand 
what does it mean to be different? What does it mean to take design constructs um, and weave them into the way that you work, the way that you share back, the way that you articulate everything that you do? And so I'm thinking of, of what she's teaching us in a, in a kind of built environment. And so to me, that is how do we make this keep happening in our way that we do business at NCIE? And the big thing that's kind of coming out for us is it is um, in a middle kind of ground in terms of no, the answer is no, we don't want you to do that. But if that happens, how do we hold the space and hold it genuinely? Yep. And so going beyond just that there's the pass and the gardens and it looks black on the outside, how is it truly black, really black and held? And to me, that's what, um, you know, this, this mix of what's trying to happen with NCIE and what Tyler's really helping us to understand yep. um, and why that's important. So that's my personal view that it's a really I'm powerful. It's a really powerful idea, that idea of being held. Um, I mean, we've heard some great things today from um, all the panellists. The audience, if you'd... Any last opportunity for questions before I wrap up and we can... Continue on to catering. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Megan, we'll have to send you photos. Um, so thank you. What a um, wonderful um, and unexpected series of stories we've heard from all of you. And it, I think, um, if anything, uh, hopefully everyone who's listening and will listen to the, 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 the video whenever it goes on Facebook, um, kind of leaves with um, a clear understanding of there are all these many ways and nuanced ways and um, shared responsibilities and onion layers <laughs> and spaces being able to be held and some really powerful ideas that have come out from today. And also um, uh, how you as Aboriginal professionals and practitioners and family members um, transfer knowledge and facilitate your voices being heard as an example for other people. So um, thank you, Sky, Claire and Megan. And um, thank you everyone for watching today.